Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Glory to Jesus Christ. My name is Father Mikhailo Kuzma, and I'm the pastor here at Immaculate Conception Ukrainian Catholic Church in Palatine, Illinois. It's a pleasure again to be with all of you. And again, my first wish is that all of you who are watching today might realize, first of all, how great is God's love for you. I say that sincerely from my heart. And second of all, no matter what struggle you might be dealing with at this present time, remember there is always hope. Let me begin with a uh, scripture from uh, Isaiah. The Lord said through this great prophet, Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I'd like to speak today a little bit about attitude. And let me begin with a story from my own life. As I mentioned in one of the previous programs, I went through a terrible depression when I was 33 years old. It lasted for a year and a half. And one of the most difficult things was dealing or trying to deal in a positive way. Those of you who have suffered from any kind of depression or anxiety or fear realize that the attitude is so vitally important. It's really very difficult to maintain a positive attitude. When I was in my depression, very often I was thinking, I wish I weren't alive. I was thinking this will never end. Life is hopeless. It has no meaning. In other words, all kinds of negative thinking. And as I mentioned before as well, it is imperative. It is vital. It is important that each one of us and each one of you try with all your mind, with all your heart to maintain as positive an attitude as you can. And one of the ways we do that is by telling ourselves, I am a free person. The devil and no one can make me remain negative. I can say to myself, as soon as negative thoughts come, I will stop. I will not continue. I will not allow myself to continue thinking negatively. And then I turn my mind around to something positive, maybe the day, how beautiful it is, my family. Maybe I read a book or watch TV, whatever might help me to get to a more positive attitude. We hear in scripture, do not let your hearts be distressed or fearful. Nothing is impossible with God. With regard to attitude, let me read first of all the scripture that we all know so very well. This is the scripture on the Mount or part of that great sermon that was uh, spoken by Jesus. And the passage I chose is in the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter five, seeing the crowds Jesus went up on the mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. They shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad. Your reward is great in heaven. So men persecuted the prophets who were before you. 
Take to heart these words at the end of this reading. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Now we have to understand that the Sermon on the Mount speaks to us from the point of view of eternity and true joy and happiness. Let me explain this. We grew up in a time, in a day, in a situation, a culture that teaches us life is about happiness. In other words, being happy, having things, acquiring things, having wonderful vacations, having a great job and so forth. And there's value in all of these things to some degree. But happiness of this sort changes from day to day. For example, uh, I buy a new car. I'm very happy with it. For a day or two, maybe a month, I don't know how long. But then I'm sort of used to it. That happiness goes away. It doesn't last. The Beatitudes speak to us about joy, blessedness. The word makarios in Greek means a blessed state, a perpetual state. It speaks to us about blessings that do not change because of the situation in which we find ourselves. True blessedness doesn't go up and down like a roller coaster as emotions do. True blessedness depends on our relationship with God and what it is we truly believe about our relationship with God, how much trust we have in Him, and what do we believe about eternal life. Now, the Beatitudes, obviously, that we heard are very counter-cultural. The world tells us basically, go for it. Eat, drink, and be merry. We've heard that phrase, right? Eat, drink, and be merry. You don't know what tomorrow brings. Tomorrow you might be dead. And Jesus is saying, no, I want you to have the joy of the Lord, peace in your heart, fulfillment, every day of your life, even when then you are going through difficult times, even trials and sufferings. Those of you who are watching, possibly all of you, or at least some of you, are dealing with something very difficult in your life. And you might think, I cannot be happy. I cannot find joy as long as it lasts. And this is not true. Again, I speak for myself. When I was in my depression, one of the things that helped me tremendously were the Psalms of praise. Because we don't feel very good does not mean that we cannot praise God. Why do we praise God? We don't praise God because of the difficulties we have. We praise God because God is God. We praise God because God loves us, no matter what, in all situations. We praise God because He is always there for us, even when we do not feel Him. We praise God because His love never ends. No matter where we are, what we've done, what we're thinking, whatever we're going through, God's love never ends. The key to true joy and happiness are, and I think if we really listen to those Beatitudes in our hearts, something inside of us tells us, wow, this is true. It might be difficult to accept, but this is true. And the Beatitudes, by the way, are the Magna Carta. You might say, as the Ten Commandments are in the Old Testament, the pathway to God. The Beatitudes are the way Jesus lived, and they are the true path for every Christian. So I'd like to examine, not very much in detail, but shortly, these Beatitudes and how they might affect us in our personal lives and how we might be able to maybe learn from them to be able to deal with our difficulties in better ways. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We're not talking here about some kind of poverty. In the kingdom of God, there is no one in heaven who is poor on the street, begging or so forth. We're not talking about that kind of poverty. Poor in spirit signifies those people who've come to a point in their lives where they realize they're not in control. They realize life very often is bigger than us. They realize that things happen that we have no control over. Poor in spirit are people who realize I am basically very little. Maybe I'm not as great as I like to think myself to be or others might think of me. I'm very little. I'm very weak. I'm very dependent as a little child on who? On God. The poor in spirit are those who realize God is great. Everything depends upon Him. And if I truly believe that, if I truly believe that everything depends on God, if I believe that God loves me, if I believe that God is my Father, and if I believe that He's with me at all times, I can find that consolation as we hear, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
the kingdom of heaven. Not only when we pass away, make our transition into eternal life, the kingdom of heaven can be already experienced here. There's a certain peace that comes upon us when we are convinced and believe strongly in our hearts that already we are living close to God. When God becomes more and more important, obviously, in my life, I look forward not only to uh, tomorrow or the day after, but I especially hope in that joy that God has prepared for each one of us. And God loves us so much, and we love God so much, hopefully we want to be with Him. And that awaits us, obviously, as we make our transition into eternal life. But blessed are the poor in spirit. These are those who have come to realize in their lives how truly dependent they are on God, how much they need Him. Psalm 34, we hear this verse, The poor man cried out, the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. The more we are detached from things in this world, the more we are attached to God, we become more and more poor in spirit. And truly, we live more and more in the kingdom of God. I'd like to say that truly in my life, as probably in your lives, God has allowed me to be tested in so many different ways. Recently, a year ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I can tell you this, God has taught me by his love to be able to live in the present moment more and more with each passing day. Also, as I get older, to realize life is today what I can do with the Lord possibly to make the world a little better place. The more I forget about myself, the happier I am, actually. The more I think about myself, the more I think about the difficulties in life and my trouble and whatnot, I become a very miserable, unhappy person. But when I concentrate on God's love for me and that he fills me with that love and I can share that love with other people, this gives me tremendous joy to share that part of the kingdom of God that God allows me to share with him at this time. The second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn they shall be comforted, we might think. Who wants to mourn? When you mourn again, there's pain, there's suffering, there's grief. Blessed are those who mourn. Why can this be a blessing? When there is tremendous sorrow very often in life, when we're really hurting, when things are very, very difficult, sometimes, have you not experienced in your life, true friends come forward? Maybe even people you don't expect, they come to you. They empathize with you. They're there for you. You realize this person is truly my friend. He's there or she's there with me when I'm really hurting. And in the same way, if we truly believe, we can understand God is working through this person. God is here with me through my friend, through this person, my next door neighbor, whoever it might be. This is the kind of compassion and mercy and love that God bestows upon me, especially when I'm hurting. I can experience it more. When I'm doing pretty well, I don't necessarily need or experience the great love, compassion of God the same, to the same extent. Those who are sorry for their sins also, this is a sorrow. This also refers to the meek, or sorry, those refers to, uh, refers to those who mourn. Because when we realize our sinfulness, when we're really down and realize, oh my God, how imperfect I am, how many things I've done in my life I shouldn't have done, and then I experience God's love, be it through the sacrament of confession, or be it through a person, we truly, truly become alive. I'll tell you this story if I can share this. I've told you, I think I've told you before, I happen to be a Catholic priest who was married. There was one time in my life when I was really not um, the kindest person I can be, put it this way. And uh, basically, I deserved someone to wake me up, maybe slap me or something to wake me up, to get me out of that bad mood I was in or whatnot. So I was a little bit unkind, and I'll never forget that day. And my wife came to me and treated me like I was gold. She loved me in spite of the fact that I really, really wasn't kind. That really did something very important in my life. I realized this is the way God is with us. He might not love our sins, our faults. He never stops loving us. God was loving me through her. 
God showed me that there's nothing I can do that will stop him from loving me. And the same holds true for you and every person on the face of the earth. God is so great that his love never, ever ends. Blessed are the persons also who realize that Christianity begins when I repent from my sins. The first message of Jesus, the first message of John the Baptist was repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. Christianity begins when I realize I need God's mercy. He came to redeem me. He loves me. He came for sinners, not for the righteous. He said that himself. I've come for the sinners of the world. I want, God wants to forgive us more than we want to be forgiven. Can you imagine such a thing? God wants to forgive us more than we want to be forgiven. And he does. And all we need to do is to little ourselves, become small, recognize the truth that we are imperfect, and that he forgives us everything and that he loves us. And if we can learn this lesson and then share it with other people, we become less judgmental. We become more accepting of people as they are. As God accepts us, we accept them. Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. There was a great philosopher thousands of years ago. You might have heard of him, Aristotle. Aristotle believed that virtues were right in the middle, found to be in the middle, between the two extremes. For example, angry, being angry as all heck, getting riled up, revealing, revealing animosity, bitterness towards people in one's voice and one's actions or whatnot. And then the meek person, the really meek in the negative sense of the word, the one who cowers and is afraid and never reacts to anything. He's so afraid. The Christian and the virtue that we're speaking of here, the virtue, of the meek is being right in the middle. That is to be angry, for example, when things are unjust in the world, a person is raped or murdered, we should be angry. The problem in our society sometimes is we're so used to evil all around us, we become sort of impervious to them. It doesn't bother us, that is not a good thing. A Christian and the virtue of meekness is one who does get upset, is unhappy, wants to do something about an evil situation. And then a meek person is also the one, someone can call me names, look at me and say things about me and I don't react. I don't let my passions get the better of me. I can remain still and accept it and offer it up to God, and maintain tranquility and peace. That's the meekness we're speaking about here. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. The meek person, again, is the person that wants so very much to keep charge of his, in, or her, his or her instincts, impulses, and so forth. They are people who truly are leaders. The greatest leaders in the world are those who know how to lead by their example. They are men and women who know how to maintain peace and calm in difficult situations. They are men and women who do not allow themselves to make decisions solely on passion and feeling. They know how to unite the mind and the heart in making decisions, seeking God's will. What is the right thing to do? Some of the great leaders in history, Alexander the Great, destroyed himself when he was angry. He made some terrible decisions when he was just overcome by his passions. In fact, he killed one of his friends. Terrible, terrible things happen when we allow ourselves to be controlled by our passions and not to control them. And this refers to those who are meek. They shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst. In the days that the scripture was written, the average inhabitant of the Holy Land at that time worked very hard, let's say, whatever menial job, let's say in the fields or whatnot, or in the city, maybe worked in a tailor shop or whatever, no matter how hard they worked, they made enough to get by. The common worker would make maybe enough to have meat once a week. Most of the week they would have just cheese and fruits and so forth, and that was already very good. So when we hear this scripture, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, we're talking about people who are really hungry, not like us. We can go half a day without food and we say we're hungry. We do not know what hunger is. True hunger is when you're really, 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 your, your, your stomach is making all kinds of growling noises and you're so thirsty, you're parched, you're, you've been in the desert for a long time and you haven't had a drink of water. That's the kind of hunger and thirst this particular 
uh, Beatitude speaks about. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for the right thing, for the good thing, for that which is proper in any particular situation. Men and women who are seeking righteousness are seeking to find justice in every situation, not only for themselves, but for other people. And you and I know the greatest people in the world, the ones that we admire the most, are not the ones who think about themselves. They're there to serve people. Jesus came and said, I've come not to be served, but to serve, to give my life as a ransom for many. Righteousness, seeking righteousness, hungering, thirsting for righteousness, is seeking the good of my brother and sister. Who's my brother and sister? Every person that I meet in any given day. What can I do for them? And that begins with the person in my family, the person I work with. It also, depend, also pertains to the person that I meet along the road. Those of you who live in Chicago or big cities realize very often you come across poor people, right? Do we wish them well? You know, the mind tells us sometimes we start thinking, well, that's a bomb, he should take care of himself, he should work, he's lazy, I'm not gonna give him anything. But if we think with the heart, perhaps he is a bum, perhaps he is lazy. We don't know his story, first of all. We don't know what's going on in his family. We don't know, maybe he can't work, we don't know. But wishing that person well is always the right thing. To say at least a prayer for them, possibly to stop, buy him a cup of coffee. I know this takes time. That is the righteousness we're talking about in this particular beatitude. Blessed are the merciful. The entire New Testament speaks to us about mercy. Forgive us our sins as we forgive. God's greatest attribute, as you and I know, as teacher St. Faustina Kowalska, is his mercy, his greatest attribute. God is merciful always and everywhere. That means that no sin of ours, nothing we do, comes close to the mercy that he shows us. So no matter what you've done in life, if you've done bad things in life, if you're down or depressed or unhappy or miserable because you've done something terrible, realize that you can get on your knees, you can ask God to give you true repentance, sorrow for your sins. Ask God to be merciful, to forgive you. Ask God to help you to be truly, truly sorrowful, to do something, whatever you can, to correct the situation. Blessed are the merciful, because when we experience God's mercy, chances are we're going to grow and become more merciful. So it begins receiving mercy from God, and then we share it with the world. As a priest, I'm very fortunate because I hear confessions all the time now for 37 years. The older you get and the more you realize no matter how hard you try, you're still imperfect. It becomes more and more difficult to judge people in confession. You realize, oh my God, my job here is not to judge people. My job here is to show them God's mercy and help them to get to a better place. Educate them or guide them or lead them or show them in some loving way, hey, this is how you make progress in this area or this area. But mercy is that attribute of God which makes life worth living in the sense that we find peace, we find forgiveness, we find God's goodness in every situation where we really don't deserve it. That's what mercy is. Blessed are the pure in heart. That means we pray constantly and never give up, asking God to help us to become more and more pure in heart, cleansed, purified, having nothing but the will of God in us. The greatest day in your life and mine is when you take total responsibility for your attitudes. That's the day that we truly grow up. You know, attitude truly is everything in our lives. It's a choice that we make. We decide whether we're gonna be positive or negative. We really have that under control. If we choose to be positive, look for what's good in life, be grateful to God for everything, we are going to be a lot happier, we're gonna be a lot healthier, we're gonna be more fulfilled, life is gonna have greater meaning, and it's a choice, so I beg you, no matter how difficult life is, Beg God every day, Lord, help me to see what is good. Again, in my depression, I make a list every day. Dot, 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 this is good, this is good. Thank you for my family. Thank you, God, that you called me to be a priest. Thank you, God, that I can serve this person. Thank you, God, that I could go visit this person. Thank you, God, for the sun shining. Thank you, God, I have food today. I make a list of all the things we can bless God for and thank God for. Our attitude 
determines what kind of character, what kind of person we are. And you know, and I know, we love to be around positive people. We love to be around people who love us, who are not caught in on themselves in their pain and sorrow. People who complain, oh, poor me, and so forth. We don't like that. We like to be around people who show and give love. And if we develop our attitude, we can do that. Let me finish with the miracle prayer. Repeat after me in your hearts. Lord Jesus, I come before you just as I am. I'm truly sorry for all of my sins. I repent of all of my sins. Please forgive me in your name. I forgive all others for what they have done against me. I renounce Satan, O oh Lord, the evil spirits and all their works. I give thee my entire self, Lord Jesus. I accept thee as my Lord, my God, and my Savior. Heal me, O oh Lord. Change me, strengthen me in body, mind, soul, and spirit. Come, Lord Jesus. Cover me with your precious blood. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I love thee, Lord Jesus. I praise thee, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I shall follow you every day of my life. Amen. Most Holy Mother of God, Queen of Peace, all the angels and saints, please help me. Jesus said, go out to the whole world and announce the good news. And that's what Shalom is doing, is bringing the good news of the Holy Spirit in action, renewing the face of the earth so that all people may know how good is the Lord, how beautiful is the work of salvation. Thank you, Shalom, for all you do to reach out, to lead the faith forward. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, I'm the Son, I'm the Holy Spirit.